Phil Moriarty, our MC, is unable to be with us tonight. He's pregnant on an investigation, and uh, we'll shortly be exposing that corruption. So I'm taking his place this evening as uh, the introducer of Ted Gunderson. Um, I personally have known Mr. Gunderson for a few years, and uh, Mr. Gunderson has quite an extensive history in exposing corruption. Uh, Mr. Gunderson was, as you know, an FBI agent for 28 years. He was special agent in charge. He has written many books, including How to Locate Someone Without Reason at Home, as well as many reports on the Oklahoma bombing, on international uh, child trafficking, international pornography, the Franklin cover-up. He helped assist uh, Senator John DeCamp with as well. So please help me give Mr. Ted Gunderson a very warm welcome. Thank you. Kathy O'Brien will be here. Let's see if I can figure it out. Oh, uh, Vernon Lodge. Uh, in uh, Vernon, uh, BC, of course. April the 15th, 7 to 10, uh, Wednesday. So, I'm sure most of you have heard Kathy and Mark before. I've uh, known them for quite a few years, and I've confirmed the information that they have furnished through other sources. As a matter of fact, I personally know of one other presidential model in addition to Kathy, and I'm aware of five others who are still underground and have not come forward. I'm going to have uh, an interesting evening for you. I assure you, you will not be bored. And uh, I'm going to give you some information that uh, you've never heard before. It's going to shock you, I'm sure. I know it will. But it's true. Everything I have has been documented. If it isn't documented, uh, and it comes from confidential sources or informants, they are reliable, credible sources. I want to start out by explaining how I became involved in these issues. Now, when we talk about these issues, we talk about uh, corruption, pedophilia, pornography, et cetera, et cetera. Not pleasant subjects at all, believe me. But uh, I served 27 and a half years in the FBI, and retired in 1979. At the time of my retirement, I was in charge of uh, most of Southern California, except for the two most Southern counties. Uh, I was immediately asked to investigate the Dr. Jeffrey R. Mac O'Donnell case, that's M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D, and he's a former Green Beret doctor who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, on February the 17th, 1970. This is 79, now this is a few years later. But he had just been convicted, sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. His doctor friend said, this man did not commit these crimes. Will you, Ted Gunderson, investigate him? And I said, yes, I would, uh, providing, uh, you know, of course, that uh, I continued the investigation on the uh, assumption or on the basis or the fact that he did not commit the crimes. In fact, I told Dr. McDonald, if I learn that you've committed these, uh, these three homicides, these murders, I will discontinue my investigation immediately while I'm still working the case. But uh, what happened in reviewing the case, I learned that evidence was lost, stolen, destroyed, altered. For example, skin under Colette, that's his wife, under her nails disappeared after it was collected by the Army. And anybody that uh, knows anything about forensics knows that from the skin you can tell the blood type of the person who was scratched. This, I'm convinced, would have exonerated Dr. McDonald, but it disappeared. The last person to have it was a fellow named William F. Ivory, who was chief investigator for the Department of the Army. And in uh, 10 months, October 25, 1980, I obtained a confession from a girl named Helena Stokely. Helena, if you know the story, by the way, this was a, a best-selling book. Uh, also, there's been a movie made uh, by NBC out of New York. And Alina is the girl in the floppy hat with the blonde wig standing on the street corner when the MP, Micah, was en route to the crime scene at about 4.30 in the morning. Didn't stop, of course, because he was en route to a triple homicide. Told his superiors about it, nobody did anything about it, no follow-up. But I learned that Alina had been an informant for the government, also that she'd been an informant for the Fayetteville, North Carolina Police Department. And uh, she was in the area at the time, and so I targeted Helena Stokely. By the way, in my FBI career, 27 and a half years, I never interviewed a suspect when I did not obtain a signed confession. And that's quite a record, believe me. 
And I said to myself when I heard this case, I, I hope I don't have to break that record, but I didn't. Uh, and I ended up obtaining that confession from Elena. She gave me the details of the homicide, the murder, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to confirm that she had been there, I gave her a polygraph, she passed. I told her to draw the interior of the house, she drew it. I told her to describe the furniture in the house, she described the furniture. She described a jewelry box on the dressing table in the master bedroom. To make sure that she was accurate, I went out and bought a Sears Roebuck catalog. Had her look through the jewelry boxes in the Sears Roebuck catalog. She picked out the very jewelry box that was in the house that night. Uh, in addition, uh, Helena tried to ride a, a horse, a rocking horse, in the child's bedroom, the two and a half year old's bedroom. The spring was broken. There's no way she would have known the spring was broken if she had not been in the house that particular night. But uh, what happened was that the story behind this is that uh, Lena was involved in uh, distributing her uh, drugs up and down the East Coast. Her cult, the ones that she said committed the murders, were the ones, there were seven of them in there that particular night. At that time, they were bringing drugs in plastic bags in the body cavities of the dead GIs coming out of uh, Vietnam. And uh, Alina's cult, satanic cult group, was distributing them, as I said. And the higher-ups in the drug operation were afraid if there was an investigation of her cult, it could expose the whole operation coming out of South Vietnam. By the way, the CIA was involved in that. And uh, so as a result, basically, they framed Dr. McDonald. The man, as I said, is still serving three consecutive life sentences. There is some hope, however. We re recently learned uh, that the two little girls had a black hair under their fingernails. Dr. McDonald is a light haired, light brown haired man. And uh, we have permission from the courts to do a DNA on these hairs and compare them with Dr. McDonald's hair. These will not match, I assure you of that. But anyway, again, going back to the case, reviewing it, FBI agent Paul Stombaugh lied before the grand jury. Another agent, Mahoney, uh, lied under oath on the witness stand. And uh, here I am, coming out of the Bureau, a great organization, impeccable reputation, a crack organization. We were probably one of the finest investigative organizations in the history of the world in our day. Not anymore, I'm sorry to say. And uh, I say, hey, what's going on here? So as a result of my work on the McDonald case, and by the way, I submitted a 1,200-page report to the U.S. Department of Justice, and instead of looking at my report and continuing my investigation, uh, FBI agents were going out and interviewing my new witnesses. I developed 19 new witnesses, interviewing Helena Stokes and trying to get them to recant. So um, I'm trying to figure out what's going on because all of a sudden I am being attacked and uh, I receive information uh, that I'm a victim of a disinformation program. I'm a homosexual suffering from mental problems, trafficking drugs, and the story goes on and on and on. And as a matter of fact, the government the U.S. government even attempted to frame me on a phony a drug operation and also on a, a false charges on a fraud case in Dallas, Texas. What happened on the drug operations, the girl that they had assigned to frame me, Pam Fawcett, ended up after six months coming over to my side and telling me the story. And I said to Pam, I said, Pam, well, why did you come over to my side all of a sudden? And I had dealt with her, by the way, on the telephone, but never met her. She said, Ted, I woke up the other morning and I realized you're the only honest son of a bitch I've talked to in six months. Those are exact words, by the way. I've got that on tape, so it's confirmed and it's documented. And uh, she even had the run of the FBI office in Modesto, California. She had her own coffee cup. They paid her $2,000 to try to set me up. And the way that she came over to my side is she had a problem with herself and with her son, and I tried to help her as a humanitarian. And, um, she realized that, recognized that, and she realized that the FBI was basically using her. So anyway, I was on national TV, a number of national radio talk shows. Um, I was on CNN, debated Freddie Kassab, the father-in-law, on national television, and also they had a psychiatrist there. And uh, I basically gave the story. And the story was, of course, that this satanic cult group had come into the house that night, got out of hand, they popped drugs at midnight, and um, it was, according to Helena, her initiation into the satanic movement. And you know, folks, 
people just came out of the woodwork from the east coast to the west coast, north to south. People contacted me, gave me the same basic story about satanic cults and about their ceremonies, multi generationals. That's a person that's been into the cult, uh, born into it, the mother and father, grandfather, grandmother involved in it. Uh, ritual abuse, that's uh, people, you know, kids usually, that are ritualistically abused rather than straight sexually abused. And the same stories over and over again from people who did not know each other. So I said, there's got to be something to this. And so I started delving into satanic cults. From there, I went to pedophilia, pornography, prostitution, corruption in the courts, law enforcement, corrupt, prosecutors, corrupt. And I basically learned through my research and through my work on the street, by the way, I do more than just research books. I'm out there, I talk to people. And I basically learned that uh, the satanic cult movement in the United States is very, very active. There are in excess of three million members. They are, there are between 50 and 60,000 human sacrifices a year. And for you folks up here in Canada, there is a network between the United States and Canada. There's an extensive amount of traffic between the Seattle, Washington area and Vancouver, BC. Children are being uh, auctioned off, that are kidnapped in the United States, are being auctioned off in Toronto, Canada, among other places. And uh, this is just a drop in the bucket of the information that I developed. I said to myself, where did this all start? What's going on? I don't understand. And by the way, in furnishing data and information specifics and documents and the truth to officials, including the FBI, the U.S. Department of Justice, I'm ignored. Nobody pays any attention to me. I'm not used to that, by the way, particularly as an FBI chief. When I, when I gave an order, people moved. I go back to Washington, D.C., personally meet with people, give them documents. Nobody does anything. Write letters, send certified copies around the U.S. attorneys, FBI, Department of Justice, Attorney General of the United States, never hear from them. I didn't like that. I don't like being ignored, particularly when I'm right. So I researched it, and I was giving this speech one night in Las Vegas about the McDonald case, and I specifically talked about the McDonald case. And the McDonald case, by the way, uh, again, it's a lecture that can take an hour and a half, two hours, if I go into details. And if I did, it would shock you. I just gave you a little smattering tonight. And after I finished this lecture in Las Vegas on the McDonald case, a man walked up to me, elderly man walked up to me, handed me this book right here. And this is the very book he handed me. And it's called Pawns in the Game. And he said, Ted, the answer to the problem is in this book. Now, I'm telling you that this story here tells it all. It talks about the Illuminati. Is there anybody here who has never heard or does not know anything about the Illuminati? Raise your hand. There's a few. Well, you're going to get a real education tonight, folks. This is a book that was written by William Guy Carr, commander of the uh, Canadian Navy, born in 1895, died in 1959. He basically had the same problem I did. He wanted to know why and what's going on. By the way, I might mention also that this book is available. I sell it through my office, and uh, we have flyers out here. And anything in the way of research that you obtain with my name on it, you're welcome to make copies. I don't worry about copyright. I'm here to educate you folks. I'm here to tell you what's going on, not only in the United States, but also in Canada. We're going to get into that later. But uh, this book is available. Uh, this is uh, not mine, so you can't make copies of this if you want to. You know, I don't really care, but um, I urge you folks to pick up a copy. This is not that expensive. Anyway, Mr. William Guy Carr, same problem I did. What's going on? He couldn't understand it. He couldn't understand why people can't live in peace. We have to have war, we have to have violence, we have to have corruption. So I read this book, and the answer, as I said, is here. Let me just give you a few excerpts from the book. 
1770, Adam Weishoff, big bird, Weishoff, Adam Weishoff, <laughs> spell it, Weishoff, Weishoff, I'll try it. I was going to say Weiss, okay? <laughs> if I miss it, forget about it. <laughs> Weishaupt. Is that it? Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt, a Jesuit trained professor of canon law who had defected from Christianity and embraced the Luciferian ideology, was retained by the money changers, also known as the House of Rothschild, to revise and modernize the age old protocols designed to give the Church of Satan ultimate world domination so they could impose the Luciferian ideology upon what remains of the human race. Seven years later, May 1, 1776, Weissopt, how's how am I doing on that? Weissopt, okay. Weissopt completed his task. The plan required the destruction of all existing governments and religions and the objective was to be reached by dividing the masses into opposing camps in ever increasing number on political, racial, social, and economic and other issues. The opposing sides were to be armed and an incident provided that would cause them to fight and weaken themselves as they destroyed the national governments and religious institutions. He established what is known as the Illuminati. The word Illuminati is derived from Lucifer and it means holder of the life. In 1776, Weishaupt put a plot into execution using the lie that his objective was to bring about the one world government to enable men with proven mental abilities to govern the world. He recruited 2,000 followers. These included the most influential intellectual men in the field of arts and science, education, finance, and industry. He established lodges of the Grand Orient to be their secret headquarters, and he initially set forth four basic goals. Later, he provided 25 individual goals. But let me just go and give you the four basic goals right in the beginning use monetary and sex bribery to obtain control of people already occupying positions in high places in various levels of all governments and other fields of human endeavor. All governments, I emphasize, folks. The number two goal was to recruit outstanding students on college campuses and train them to accept the fact that only a one world government can put an end to recurring wars and tribulations. Number th three, those uh, trapped through sex and drugs, i.e. blackmail, and who had been especially trained were to be placed behind the scenes of all governments as advisors and experts so they could influence various adopted policies and serve the secret plans of the one worlders. Number four, control the press. Now, going back in 1773, Meyer Rothschild, who was only 30 years of age at the time, invited 12 other wealthy and influential men to meet him in Frankfurt. His purpose was to convince them to pool their resources and then finance and control the world revolutionary movement and win ultimate control of the wealth, natural resources, and manpower of the entire world. During the meeting, Rothschild read a carefully prepared plan of action. And this plan was prepared by Weishaupt. Number one, preach liberalism. Number two, use the idea of freedom to bring about class war. This, the book outlines it much more in detail than this. I'm doing an abbreviated version of it, by the way. Number three, any and all means were justified to reach their goal. Number four, their rights lie in force. 
five, the power of our resources must remain invisible until the very moment when it has gained such strength that no cunning or force can undermine it. That's what's happened today, folks. You don't know about this, do you? Mainstream media never told you about this. I'm telling you about it. It's exactly what's happened. It remained invisible. And it's not too far away before I think that the one world or the globalists are going to move on us. Six, advocate a mob psychology to obtain control of the masses. Seven, use alcohol, drugs, moral corruption, and all forms of vice to systematically corrupt the youth of the nations. That isn't happening now. That's been very well documented. Seize property by any means. Deal with the use of slogans such as equality, liberty, fraternity into the mouths of the masses in psychological warfare. Bill Clinton, if I ever heard of. The next one dealt with war. In 1773, he set down policies that were publicly announced in 1939 by the U.S. and Britain. War should be directed so that nations on both sides be placed further in debt and peace conferences conducted so neither combatants obtained territorial rights. Next, told those present that they must use their wealth to have candidates chosen to public office who would be obedient to their demands and would be used as pawns in the game by the men behind the scenes. The advisors would have been bred, reared, and trained from childhood to rule the affairs of the world. The next one, control the press. Number 13, their agent tours will come forward after fomenting traumatic situations and appear as the saviors of the masses when they are actually interested in just the opposite, the killing off of the masses. Next, create industrial depression and financial panics unemployment, hunger, shortage of food. Use this to control the masses or the mob and use the mob to wipe out all those who dare to stand in its way. 15, infiltrate into the secret Freemasonry to be used for their purposes. That boils down to a secret society within a secret society, by the way. Not all Freemasons would fall in that category. Next, Expound the value of systematic deception. Use high-sounding slogans and phrases and advocate lavish promises to the masses even though they cannot be kept. Next, the detailed plans for revolution. Discuss the art of street fighting, which is necessary to bring the population to speedy subjection. Next, use their agent tours as advisors behind the scene after the war through secret diplomacy to gain control. Establish huge, monop huge monopolies toward world government control. Use high taxes and unfair competition to bring about economic ruin by controlling raw materials, organized agitation among the workers, and subsidizing competitors. Build up armaments with police and soldiers sufficient to protect our interests. Members and leaders of the one world government would be appointed by a dictator at the appropriate time. Infiltrate into all classes and levels of society of government for the purpose of fooling, bemusing, and corrupting the youth members of society by teaching them theories and principles that we know to be false. And last, national and international laws should be used to destroy civilization. Now, in 1784, by an act of God, the Bavarian government, in possession of evidence which would prove the existence of the continued Luciferian conspiracy, Weishaupt, Weishaupt, how am I doing, Coach? <laughs> conspiracy had been placed into a book form. A copy of the book was sent to a Weishaupt delegate used to foment the French Revolution. The courier was struck by lightning as he rode from Frankfurt to Paris, divine intervention, obviously. The police found the subversive documents on the body and turned it over to the proper government authorities. And after a careful study by the Bavarian government, they raided the newly organized lodges of the Grand Orient and the homes of Weishaupt's most influential associates. 
Additional evidence was located that documented the Illuminati plan to use wars and revolutions to bring about the establishment of a one world government. The Illuminati went underground and Weisshoff instructed his Illuminists to infiltrate the lodges of the Blue Masonry and form a secret society within a secret society. A few years later, 1829, the Illuminati held a meeting in New York. It was decided to unite the various groups into an organized group known as communism. Funds were raised to finance Karl Marx and Engels' uh, books, which they wrote, Das Kapital, and the Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto under the direction of one group of Illuminists, and Professor Karl Ritter, of Frankfurt University advanced his writings through another group of Illuminists. After Ritter died, a German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, continued with Ritter's writings and his philosophy later developed into fascism and Nazism. Did I pronounce that right? Nietzsche. Nietzsche, okay. Thereafter, agent tours of the Illuminati were used to prevent World War I and World War II. In 1840, General Albert Pike accepted the idea of a one world government and ultimately became head of the Luciferian priesthood. Between 1859 and 1871, he worked out the details of a military blueprint for three world wars and three major revolutions, which he considered would further the conspiracy to its final stage during the 20th century. Can any thinking person deny that the conspiracy revised by Weishaupt in the later 1700s and the plans drawn up by Pike in the later 1800s have matured exactly as intended? The empire of Russia and Germany have been destroyed, those of Britain and France reduced to a third power. The world's population has twice been divided into opposing camps Two world wars have seen Christians kill, kill Christians by the millions, and two of the major revolutionaries, Russia and China, are accomplished facts. Intrigue not going on in the East and the Middle East is fomenting a third world war. That basically is from Pawns in the Game, documents the problems today, and I want to show you that the Illuminati is alive and well. This is an article that appeared in the Picayune, Mississippi newspaper, January 27, 1997, a year or so ago. A meeting of the mightiest met in Geneva. And as you can see, they are described as Illuminous. <coughs> Those present included Gingrich, uh, representatives uh, from Great Britain, uh, Rifkin, uh, Netanyahu from Jerusalem, from uh, Israel. We had uh, Bill Gates, businessman there. The Illuminati is alive and well, as I said. This basically shows you that even though the Illuminati was established some 200 and some years ago, we have them still active today. And how do the Illuminati operate and how they continue to operate through the years? You recall one of the goals was to control the press. This is a document from the U.S. Congressional Record, February 9, 1917. Um, and this document states that the J.P. Morgan interest, right here, gathered 12 men together high up in the newspaper world, employed them to do a survey of 179 newspapers. And out of the 179 newspapers, they picked 25, which they felt if they purchased and placed their editors in place, they could control the press. This is a page two of the same directory, congressional record, you see page 2948. 
Well, uh, that's fine. So you control 25 of the leading newspapers. What about all the other problems around the country and the world? This is a book. It's available also through me. It's uh, called Who's Who of the Elite by Robert Galen Ross. And this will tell you how many members and the identity of the members who are in the Bilderbergers, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, Skull and Bone Society, Committee of 300. What we have here in these groups are the leading politicians, the leading businessmen, the leading dignitaries, the leading bureaucrats in the world who have splintered off from the Illuminati and formed their own, and formed their own groups. These are the people that run the world. These are the people that tell us when we can sell and when we can buy and where we can go and what we can do. And this gives you an indication of how many of them are in the news media and control of the news media. We have here Television Broadcasting Network in America, ABC, CNN, CBS, etc. 29. These are not reporters. These are editors high up in the organizational structure. Here we have Time Magazine, Publishing, Magazine Publishing. I might also mention commercial banks and federal government, etc. 46 in the publishing business. This is a speech that was given by Rockefeller at a Bilderberger meeting in June 1991. And what he said is, we are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years but the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supernatural sovereignty of an intellectual elite and the world bankers is surely more preferable to the national audio determination practiced in past centuries. That's what they say. Next. This is a speech given by the, uh, in 1953 by John Swinton, former chief of staff of the New York Times, and I won't go read it for detail, but what it basically says, I'll read the end of it. He talks about the business of journalism is to destroy truth, to lie outright, to pervert, to vilify, to fawn at the feet of mammon, and to sell his country and his race for his daily bread. You know it, and I know it, even before a group of other editors, by the way. And whatever folly is this toasting an independent press, we are the tools of the vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks. They pull the strings and we dance. Our talents, our possibilities, and our lives are all the property of other men. We're intellectual prostitutes. This gives you an idea of how the news is slanted, tainted, and how information, how the public can be influenced. This is the Freeman case right across the border in Montana. And uh, you remember that case, and I'm sure there's a lot of publicity on it. This is, they brought an expert in, Associated Press. They brought this expert in and asked him about the case. And uh, he basically talked about uh, the signs of the group leaning more heavily on the racist Christian identity teachings that form the basis of their politics. Right here. And later on, he talks about, uh, my light isn't working again. Uh, they believe there's a world conspiracy that has signaled them out and the satanic powers will be turned against them down lower. Push that up a little bit, please. Uh, talk about uh, the Christian identity movement holds that white people from Northern Europe are God's children while Jews are the offspring of Satan and blacks are subhuman mud people. This is typical slanting of the press and the news. Here's another example. This is uh, a rally that was held in Washington, D.C. This is from the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. August 30, 1996. I attended this rally. I was one of the speakers. It was not an anti-government group. It was a pro-constitutionalist group. And it was a pro-anti-corruption group. This is a story that uh, involves the death of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Rothschild. He died in uh, a hotel room in Paris. Rupert Murdoch, who had 600 media outlets. 
issued instructions to all those outlets under no circumstances should you say anything other than he died from natural causes or from suicide. Here is an article that appeared in the Las Vegas Review Journal. And as you can see, the bank heir Rothschild, Amschel Rothschild, hangs himself, is what the headlines are. And the truth is, oh, thank you. I'll throw this in the way I have it here. See if I can just figure out how to work it. How's it working? You say? I got it. Ah, very good, thank you. The truth is, police say that Amschel was murdered. Here it is right here. He sent hotline facts to 600 editors and news managers around the world, ordering them to report his death as a heart attack, if at all. Total fabrications, and they get away with it on a regular basis. Your media in Canada isn't any better than ours. I assure you that. Okay, here we go. This is uh, how they control the politicians. Turn it off just a minute, will you please? In the late 1980s, I received a phone call from Lincoln, Nebraska. And a friend of mine had read my name in a book called The Ultimate Evil, a book by Maury Terry about the son of Sam Burns, New York City. And uh, his name was Ed Weaver. And Ed said, are you Ted Gunderson who uh, went to high school with me and graduated from the University of Nebraska? And I said, yes, I am. We need your help. Come back. I went back to Omaha, Lincoln, Nebraska. There had been an arrest made. The police had come out of the house where they made the arrest with extensive pornographic material. There was some publicity in the newspaper in Omaha. A man's picture was shown in the, to the public. Eighty children came forward and said that they were part of a pedophile pornographic operation. Of the 80 who came forward, four gave statements. Two later recanted, two refused to recant, Paul Benassi and Alicia Owen. Alicia Owen claimed that when she was 14 years old, the chief of police, Bob Wadman, had sex with her on a regular basis. The children named some of the leading businessmen in Omaha, Nebraska, the past publisher of the Omaha World Herald, Harold Anderson. The head of the Nebraska Forestry Service, Eugene Mahoney, the heir to the Brandeis fortune. The editor of the Society page of the Omaha World Herald, the chief of police, Bob Wadman. And it was really a shocker. And of course, uh, being as the past publisher of the Omaha World Herald, Harold Anderson was named uh, to say, that, to the least, that the media information was very sketchy and very limited, slanted and tainted. Nevertheless, the information did leak out. And I was asked to help on the investigation. As a result of that investigation, we learned that there was an international child kidnapping ring in the Midwest. Paul Benassi, one of the kids who was talking, gave me a statement and stated that he was used as a decoy in parks and malls and public places to bring the children over near the car where the adults were located. Thereafter, the adults would grab the kids and make off with them. The kids would end up being auctioned off in two places, Toronto, Canada, and Las Vegas, Nevada. A blonde-haired, blue-eyed, 10, 11-year-old child, male or female, will sell for $50,000. Paul told me that these kids were placed on airplanes in some instances, placed in campers. The ones that were placed in airplanes, the planes took off. There were foreigners with foreign accents, turbans, and um, there were police officers there. And he said that the children he felt were being used as uh, sex slaves in some instances, for body parts in other instances, uh, satanic ritual human sacrifices in other instances. And um, I wrote a letter to the FBI, to the US Department of Justice Attorney General William Barr, wrote a letter to the governor of the state of Nebraska, to the attorney general of the state of Nebraska, and I said, don't believe me, I'm only former head of the FBI in Southern California. Contact me, I'll give you my sources. You do your own investigation. 
I received two responses of the four letters. One, your uh, sources are not credible. They didn't even know who my sources were, by the way. Number two, you do not have adequate documentation. I immediately furnished 12-page adequate documentation and uh, never heard back from them. By the way, uh, this report and details concerning this case are available uh, on the uh, missing children a flyer that you see, uh, a book that you see on my flyer. In addition to this, Paul told me that children were being taken out of orphanages and private homes and foster homes, by the way, and uh, driven from Omaha to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles, placed in private jets, flown to Washington, D.C., for sex orgy parties with congressmen, senators, and dignitaries, bureaucrats, ambassadors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the man who was behind this was a fellow named Larry King, not Larry King Live, but a black man who was a rising star in the Republican Party. He had a salary at the Franklin Savings and Loan. By the way, this uh, Franklin Savings and Loan was set up to help minorities uh, provided to be provided with banking opportunities. He had a salary there of $17,000. He rented a condominium on Embassy Row, Washington, D.C. for $5,000 a month. This is where the parties took place. In talking to Paul Benassi and him furnishing me information as to who attended these parties, sex orgy parties, children, 10, 11, 12 years old primarily, it reads like who's who in American politics. Shocking. Absolutely shocking. There's a book out on this called The Franklin Cover-Up. Again, it's also available through my flyer and research. But I'm going to give you, right now, the documentation on the blackmailing of politicians. These kids, not only here in the United States, not over there in the United States, but I'm sure here, because of the Toronto connection, the same thing is taking place in Canada. I'm positive. I know it is. This is an article from the uh, Washington Times, Wednesday, July 5, 1989, top Japanese politician linked to Spence. Craig Spence was a CIA agent who was used to set up these top politicians and bureaucrats. Once his identity was discovered, and you see it is discovered here, was discovered here, uh, he was found in the trunk of an automobile some six months later. Dead men don't talk. Another article, Washington Times, uh, June 30, 1989, drug power served, drugs, sex at parties, bug for a black male. Talk about uh, uh, child pro uh, prostitution in the White House, Craig Spence again. Another article, Homosexual Prostitution Probe and Snarls officials, Snarls officials of Bush and Reagan. Cowboys took a midnight tour of White House. Now, this is the Washington Times. This is not considered a mainstream media source. This is not the Washington Post. Uh, Paul Benassi knew Craig Spence, and Paul Benassi has drawn the inside of the White House, the living quarters of the White House which gives him credibility. That area is not visited by the general public. This is one of the techniques and one of the goals of the Illuminati, which I mentioned to you just a few moments ago. <coughs> Cross, take the third off now. Now let me give you... Oops, I think I broke it. I hate these things anyway, to be honest with you. I probably have a loud enough voice. I don't need this. Do I in the back? Or I don't know. Maybe I, yeah. I do need it? Okay. Okay, listen. I want to tell you about an intelligence meeting that took place at the White House December the 5th and the 6th of 1980. It was attended by top CIA officials, Bill Casey, he was head of the CIA at the time, and top White House officials, including then Vice President George Bush. And they issued a white paper. And what they decided was, rather than have war or peace, there's a third option. We can have turmoil 
covert operations, domestic unrest throughout the world. And Bush authored an executive order, 12333. Three, three. Now, executive orders are unconstitutional. Executive orders were originally designed to furnish direction, executive orders to departmental heads within the federal government. But our presidents in years, for years now, have used them uh, for other purposes. Uh, executive orders to the people, that gives them dictatorial powers, by the way. And Executive Order 12333 allowed the CIA to, con uh, to contract out covert operations to outsiders, other than people that are within the government itself. And in December 1981, President Reagan signed it. Now, in 1981-82, the CIA moved people to the Pentagon to avoid congressional oversight. And among other activity, they infiltrated the National Guard. Bush sent a policy memo to all federal agencies involved in the intelligence field, and he assigned an individual to each agency, gave him the title of Special Compartmentalized Intelligence Agent, with instructions that if an agent in the field learns of large caches or large-scale drug or arms operation, he is not to investigate it, but uh, rather furnish it information back to this compartmentalized intelligence agent, and the matter would be handled in Washington, D.C. And the instructions were issued with the stipulation that if a field agent refused to comply with these instructions, he would be dismissed from employment and prosecuted. This is in force today, and this is a matter, of course, that allows and provides the White House and our government with unlimited, almost unlimited power in investigating caches of arms and drugs. Now, why would they do that? Well, I can tell you why they did it. Because the CIA is the biggest drug dealer in the world. The CIA has been bringing drugs into this country for years, going back to the Vietnam War and prior to that. Air America, CIA operation, Southern Air, more recently known instead of Air America because of the publicity about Air America, are examples. In Amino, Arkansas, when, George, when Bill Clinton was governor, the CIA were bringing drugs in to Amina, arms and munitions out. This is better known as Iran-Contra. And Iran-Contra was real. Ali North, people, many people consider him an American hero. He was involved in it. I have a number of CIA friends, ex primarily, who were also involved in it. And when we had the drug hearings in Washington, D.C., a year ago last fall, over whether or not the CIA were bringing drugs into South Central Los Angeles to the black areas, our inspector, we call him Magic Bullet, our magic bullet our inspector because he claimed on the Kennedy assassination the bullet went 90 degree angles about four times before it settled in John Conway's body. <laughs> That's right, the magic bullet. Anyway, our inspector was in charge, his committee, and they brought nebulous witnesses, in, nebulous in that they had no direct knowledge of any drug operations. I personally sent the Spectre Committee the names of 16 individuals who had first-hand knowledge of CIA drug operations bringing drugs into this country. Now, one of those individuals was called and asked to testify. So, that's the way that the government is now controlling the situation and has been for some time. We talked briefly about Bill Clinton. I mentioned his name. Bill Clinton is an unbelievable, uh, as uh, my friend Bill Well called him, I guess you called him a dirtbag, wouldn't you, Bill? Yeah, anything. Anything along those lines. The man absolutely deserves no respect. Uh, when he was governor of Arkansas, he uh, established the Arkansas Development Finance Authority, which was a state agency designed to furnish loans to schools, churches, and students. Instead, it was used to launder drug money coming out of the Mena Arkansas operation. 
and the money was then used uh, and transferred to BCCI Bank of Credit and Commerce International in Florida, in Atlanta, Georgia, Russ Zinkowski, U.S. representative Russ Zinkowski's Bank in Chicago, and you had a BCCI bank, I believe it was Toronto at the time. By the way, these banks all failed in 1991 when they were exposed for their laundering, drug laundering activity. But Bill Clinton, just to give you a rundown, he said he's a Rhodes Scholar, he never finished. He went to Moscow during the Cold War, he organized and participated in anti-American rallies in London, England, during the Vietnam War. As governor, he said he balanced the budget 11 times, he never balanced the budget once. He said he didn't uh, raise taxes, he raised them 126 times. Uh, former Congressman Denemeyer, California, has the best one sentence description of Bill Clinton I can think of. Describes him as a draft dodging, womanizing, pathological liar who should be impeached. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you're aware of the survey that was recently conducted in the United States. They asked the American women if they'd go to bed with Bill Clinton. Half of them said no, the other half said never again. <laughs> and I don't know if you're aware of why he wears boxer shorts. Just keep his ankles warm. Okay, turn on the machine there, Bill. <laughs> Um, okay, this is, we, we mentioned Bill Clinton. This is some of the power that Bill Clinton has right today. These are executive orders. I mentioned executive orders, unconstitutional. But Bill Clinton, right today, if he wanted to, declare martial law, take over all means of communication, electric power, petroleum, gas, fuel, minerals, all food resources, farms, transportation, seaports, highways, workforces, health, welfare, educational functions, and airports, aircraft, railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. That's the power Bill Clinton, as President of the United States, has today. Let's compare that with the Communist Manifesto. Communist Manifesto, abolition of private property, heavy progressive income tax, abolition of all rights of inheritance, confiscation of property of all immigrants and rebels, central bank, government control of communication and transportation, government ownership of factories and agricultural, uh, government control of labor, corporate farms, regional planning, government control of education. George Bush. I can tell you a few things about George Bush. I can't give you any sex stories about him. I could, but I wouldn't dare. His, his, story, his stories about his sex life are worse than Bill Clinton's, I'll tell you right now. Um, let's talk about George Bush. He was our president, a Republican. By the way, there's not a, people you say are not a dime worth the difference between a Republican and a Democrat, but with the inflation and uh, spending, there's not a trillion dollars worth the difference between a Republican and a Democrat. But uh, prior to leaving office, George Bush signed a treaty, and this treaty was not ratified by Congress, and if it's not ratified, it automatically becomes law in 90 days in the United States. This treaty allowed foreign troops to come in and operate in America. Friends have seen troops by the thousands in the United States, foreign troops, that is. They call them United Nations peacekeepers peacekeeping troops. You folks think you're exempt from that? I'm sorry to say you're not. Let me just read an intelligence report that I received recently. And this is only the beginning. Presently, Russian and Chinese New World Order forces are working rapidly in Canada with the full blessing of the Canadian government to prepare for their troops to enter into America under martial law across the Canadian border. Now what they're talking about here is that uh, when the President of the United States declares martial law, that the Russian and Chinese troops will be used to come in and invade America from the north. In anticipation of Russian and Chinese New World Order forces coming over the border from Canada to help subdue the American resistors under martial law, 
Interstate highways such as I-90, which would uh, carry traffic from the Peace Bridge of Niagara Falls from Canada into America, have been reinforced and hardened, especially at and on officer ramps, to support heavier weight uh, military transportation vehicles. I have personally observed this while traveling thousands of miles across America and Canada. These are, we have a pretty good network of people, by the way, on both sides of the border. Russia has promised Canada that in exchange for their cooperation in this, um, once America is successfully seized by the new world order, it will give Canada the states of Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho. And this uh, report goes on. According to sources obtained, uh, the Russian nuclear submarines are presently based off the coast of Washington state. Russian stealth hel helicopters have also been observed practicing takeoffs and landings on the coast as well. Currently, thousands of Russian intelligence agents are known to be located in both Washington State and British Columbia, as well as Alaska, and in southern Mexico. Multitudes of Russian and other foreign New World Order forces are stationed with military hardware waiting for what that given cue from this administration to come up and help to do America under martial law. One military chaplain reported recently that two Indian villages in Durango were destroyed by these forces during mock invasion exercise killing the inhabitants. It talks about Russian troops and German troops who are now assigned to Holloman Air Force Base in southern New Mexico. Our people have talked to the German troops there and been told that when martial law is declared that the German troops will be used, the Air Force, German Air Force, to strengthen uh, the streets of America. Now the game plan, again, according to our sources, is right today and in the past several years, the CIA has been furnishing the Crips and the Bloods and the street gangs with munitions and arms extensively. And the street gangs will eliminate the police. After that, the New World Order forces will eliminate the street gangs because after the police are eliminated, the street gangs can come after us you and I in our homes, and then the New World Order forces will take over. The president will use the incident uh, to declare martial law at the proper time. Here's a couple of other little items that I want to mention to you. Uh, oh, by the way, this is an article from the Dallas Morning News, July 1, 19